All right, so I think I will go ahead and uh, kick us off and nobody came to listen to me anyway. So uh, if they log in a little later, the important stuff will be there. So good morning, everybody. I do appreciate you uh, logging in to the second of our three part webinar series on erosion and management and sediment control. And so, um, my name is Mike Shelton. I'm the training program coordinator at the Weeks Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. It's a partnership, federal state partnership with uh, NOAA and the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources uh, Lands Division Coastal Section. So I do wanna uh, get, that, get that bill paying out of the way right now, and, uh, but also thank uh, the, the additional sponsors that we have uh, and, and namely Laura Smith at the uh, Baldwin County Soil and Water Conservation District, a great partnership that we've been have that we've had for a long time when it comes to conducting uh, workshops and training events. Uh, and that brings us to sort of why we're here. You know, again, this is uh, you can see the the title of the workshop and the the, the uh, information that we're trying to get across regarding these three practices. And uh, that's uh, but. How did we get to that point? And again, what the, what the Coastal Training Program does at Weeks Bay is uh, we try to find out what people want. And that's how we came to, uh, through a needs assessment process, as well as post-evaluation, post-workshop evaluations. And you'll hear that again from me uh, as we get towards the end of uh, the workshop, uh, that we do need for you to complete those post-workshop evaluations. Because again, that's how we go uh, and determine topics in the future. So that's our, our goal is to give people what they want. And this came up as an important topic uh, for erosion management and sediment control. So again, thank you to Laura and thank you to Barry and Mike who really worked hard to put these uh, workshops together. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it uh, over to them and uh, they, they will uh, fill you in on whatever I forgot to do. So thanks very much and look forward to uh, this event as well as the next one. Yeah, well, Mike Shelton and, and Laura, thank you again for, for having Mike Perez and I and, and all of the, the folks that are, that are on the call on the workshop with us today. Um, so I, I see that a few of you weren't able to attend the, uh, the workshop we had uh, Tuesday of this week. So this is this is the second of a three-part series on managing uh, erosion and sediment control in coastal areas. And of course, uh, it's uh, our 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 content is directed toward the coastal audience. But the the things that we're teaching and the the, the principles for sure uh, would apply anywhere. And so I, I appreciate those uh, those inlanders of us who have also joined. Uh, this week has been a, a wet week on the on the coast, and I hope you guys have had an opportunity to to start at least thinking about some of the things that we've uh, we talked about on Tuesday. And and uh, hopefully today we'll give you some more uh, information that will help you to become better at what you do as a stormwater professional. And and I, I want to say that uh, I enjoy helping good people get better at managing construction stormwater. And, and I appreciate you guys uh, choosing to spend your time and, and trusting your time with, uh, with us today. Um, so I'm, I'm probably gonna be, uh, well, I will be more brief uh, with the introduction than I, than I was last time. This, we've got a lot of content to cover. We're, we're covering actually three sediment control practices today. And so there's a lot of content and most of you have uh, got a pretty good uh, feel for the background. I will touch on some, some familiar slides and some familiar points to, to a lot of you just uh, in consideration of those who are just joining us for the first time today. So uh, I'm Barry, uh, Barry Fagan. I, I lead an environment and infrastructure group for Volkert. Uh, Volkert is based there in, in Mobile on, in, along the Gulf Coast and uh, um, the, the group that I lead, we're environmental planners, environmental designers, and environmental professionals who uh, who deal with permitting and compliance. And uh, so, so my group is is based 
in in the south, southeast here, and uh, but we have folks from uh, all over the not all over the country. Say our our footprint goes from maybe Texas to the Great Lakes over to the eastern coast, and then down into Florida. That's kind of our footprint, and and I see some of our folks from uh, from the the Illinois area on the call or on the workshop with us today. So hopefully you guys can uh, get some good stuff out of this also. My background is uh, I've been with, with Volkert for about four and a half years now. I retired from the Alabama Department of Transportation in uh, October of 2016. And uh, for the 26 years prior to that, I worked in construction uh, out in the field as an inspector and, and project engineer. And, uh, and then ultimately in, our, um, in the State Construction Bureau and, and became a, an assistant state construction engineer that dealt with environmental issues uh, on construction sites. And as you can imagine, a good portion of that learning uh, was, was about storm, construction stormwater management. And uh, we had some, some years of pain and misery to, uh, to try to overcome. And, and, and we sincerely sought uh, to find the, the best practices, the best ways of doing things, not just to satisfy a regulator, not just to to check a box, but to truly find best ways to, to manage construction stormwater in a way that protected water quality, but also facilitated development and progress and fulfilled the mission of our agency of, of providing a transportation system for the movement of people and goods. And so through that work, we, uh, we did a lot of research and we invested a lot of money into our research and actually helped to uh, fund a, a testing facility at Auburn University and, and started doing research and testing, testing the, the products and the practices that we were using to see if we could make those better, but also doing research into creating new and, and better best practices. And that's where I met Mike Perez along the way. And uh, we've, we've partnered on a, a lot of projects and, and uh, efforts like this uh, we, we've presented together on a you know state and regional and, and, and even national stages with Transportation Research Board and the International Erosion Control Association and um, I, I appreciate Mike's technical work and, and, and certainly his character but I also appreciate his his heart for uh, for teaching and sharing the, the best practices that he's, he's truly put some time and effort and, and thought into creating. Uh, he doesn't mind sharing that knowledge with the rest of the world, and, and he does that. And so he and I are both involved in that International Erosion Control Association, but also the Alabama Stormwater Association. And if you guys are, are interested in digging a little bit deeper into construction stormwater, I would I uh, highly recommend both of those organizations. And if you want to want to get in quickly today, uh, the Alabama Stormwater Association, just do a quick search for, for that term. Uh, go to our website, check out some of the events and, and some of the things that we've been up to over the last couple of years and sign up. It's free for you to become a member and uh, just get signed up and then you'll be, become aware of a future stormwater related uh, educational events and happenings in the state of Alabama. So uh, Mike Perez, you want to introduce yourself and, and kind of kick us off here? Yeah, thank you, Barry. So um, I'm currently an assistant professor at Auburn University. I teach uh, no, mostly construction courses, but I also teach construction stormwater and erosion and sediment control uh, to both undergraduates and, and graduate students. Um, I also help direct the research at the Erosion and Sediment Control Testing Facility, um, and I've, I've been involved with the research there for the past almost 10 years now. Um, and so we've had an opportunity to work closely with uh, the Alabama DOT to help them improve the construction stormwater practices that are used on highway construction sites here in the state of Alabama. And so I'll be sharing um, a few pictures from our test facility and, and some of the, the research that's come out uh, to help improve uh, some of these um, erosion and sediment control practices. So I'm, I'm excited to be here presenting with you all and sharing this knowledge. Um, and just a, a couple of items here before we get kicked off. Um, I do want to share that the, uh, the slides are available for download. Um, I put the link in the chat box, but it's also here on the screen. Uh, you can access that page and download a PDF of the slides we'll be covering today, as well as the slides that we covered on, on Tuesday. Um, 
a second reminder is that we're using poll EV again uh, to help uh, uh, collect responses and to, to have a little bit more interaction uh, with all of you. And so uh, if you haven't already done so, please jump on pollev.com and uh, it's gonna ask you to register, uh, but you'll wanna also enter the access code, which will be my name, Michael Perez, followed by the number 747. And uh, that'll bring up our, our first poll question just to get things warmed up. And uh, we just wanted to get a feel for what everybody's been doing for the last year or so when, as we've been locked up. And uh, I know a lot of us have picked up new, new hobbies. So uh, I personally have been doing some backyard chicken farming, uh, but I wanted to see if uh, anybody else had some interesting hobbies that they've been uh, working on here in the last few months. It's like we've got some folks doing real estate and that one's showing up real big. So that must be several people saying real estate stuff. Cameras, so maybe some photography, cooking, birding. Very cool. Skating, kids. Cats. So this is just uh, an idea here how Poly V can help us uh, just be a little bit more interactive and and uh, you know get some responses from all of you. So this is this is cool. Thanks for for playing along. I will say, Mike, before we uh, leave Poly V, uh, we will be checking in with you along the way and asking you a couple of questions and just to, to increase engagement, but but also to make sure you're paying attention. Uh, and I will say that uh, I didn't know that we would get this in a report, but we can actually rank the, uh, the number of accurate answers. And last week we had a three-way tie for 100% complete on the, uh, uh, or 100% accurate on the, the questions we asked. So congratulations to Ronnie Adams and Chad Wallace and, and Tracy Fagan. And I'd, I'd like to say that they won an award, you know, up to thousands of dollars, but but anyway, th this is it. This is your reward. So good job, guys. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll advance from here. And uh, Barry, you may have to click. I'm not letting me click. Okay. But uh, today's purpose, we've got three main learning objectives we want to cover. Uh, so by the end of the presentation, the end of the workshop today, you should be able to explain the function and the role of sediment control practices within a stormwater management plan. You should be able to describe the state of the practice for sediment control practice selection. And then also you should be able to apply learned principles and processes to design a sediment control practice layout for maximum effectiveness. And Barry, I'll pass it to you to introduce us or to introduce the topics today. Yeah, okay. Um, so, as I mentioned before, we've got a lot of content to go through, so I, in, I guess in the interest of balancing that time with uh, consideration for those of you who weren't able to join us on Tuesday, we're going to, I guess, briefly walk through kind of this, this introductory section of, uh, of the function and the role, and, uh, and just to, I guess, to let you know, so Tuesday, uh, we address vegetation management. As a, as a part of a comprehensive plan of, of managing construction stormwater. And, and today it's gonna to be more related to uh, managing sediment. And something that I've, uh, I like to, to start out with the why as I get into to any type of workshop like this, before we get into the what and the how, I like to talk about why we do what we do. And um, I, have laid that out for years as you know three three big reasons are the land water and then the law so if if you're not interested in uh protecting the land or protecting water uh maybe you're interested in in staying compliant uh, with regulatory requirements so let's walk through those again pretty quickly um in the last workshop we talked about how the the role of vegetation and vegetation management uh, can actually reduce the um, these these rates of sediment loss in these these different types of of activities and and like uh, with the last workshop and uh, in the next workshop we're focusing on on construction stormwater management and you can see that 
the the yield from construction sites is is pretty incredible 35 to to 45 tons per acre per year being lost to our waterways and um and that's that's not just harmful to the waterways it's also losing a very valuable natural resource in topsoil oftentimes so let's dig into to that I, I showed you last week some some photos from the the Cahaba River in in central Alabama and we talked about how how sensitive that stream is and and the not just the the water itself but the the habitat that it provides for uh, a, a huge number of different species of of aquatic uh, aquatic critters that that are negatively impacted by the the introduction of sediment and siltation into that habitat and and I reminded you that uh, not only do we have issues in central Alabama, but we also have issues in, in along the coast also. And so oftentimes we we like to blame uh, the problems in, in Mobile Bay, the water quality problems in Mobile, Mobile Bay on the, the in, inlanders uh, up further in the watershed. But as you can see from the photo on the, the right, uh, we, we have some we, we have issues with sediment. Uh, right there locally from Mobile and Baldwin counties. And we talked a little bit about uh, Big Creek Lake on the, the left side of the screen there and uh, and the impacts of construction stormwater uh, that, that took place there, I don't know, a decade ago or so when this, this article was put out. Um, and the, the Clean Water Act is is really the basis for, for, for all of our environmental laws related to uh, stormwater management. There are other water quality related um, regulations and acts that uh, that are not the Clean Water Act. But as far as managing stormwater, the requirements to manage stormwater, those are uh, those originate in the Clean Water Act. And that act was was passed in 1972, you know, getting close to 50 years ago. Uh, and, and it was passed with a specific purpose of restoring and maintaining the chemical, physical and biological integrity of our nation's waters. Uh, and with some specific goals, eliminate pollutants to our waters by 1985, restore our waters to, to a condition of, of fishable and swimmable by, by 1983. And all these years later, we still haven't met those goals. Uh, here in Alabama, just take rivers and streams, we're, we're over 3000 miles of rivers and streams in Alabama are, are impaired. They don't meet their designated uses. Uh, they're not, fishable or swimmable, or they don't support wildlife or a drinking water supply, whatever they've been de designated to, uh, to, to serve us, they, they're not meeting those designated uses. And, and even that uh, Big Creek Lake, that's the, the drinking water supply for a third of a million people down there in the, the Mobile area. And right now you can't eat the fish out of it uh, just because of, of, of legacy pollution and uh, so, so we're not there yet, and if we're ever going to meet those goals of the Clean Water Act, it's going to take professionals like you and, and me to, to make sure that we continue to get better every day of the week uh, in, in how we manage stormwater, and that's construction stormwater and post-construction stormwater. So as, I guess, spinning out of that Clean Water Act is, uh, is the A Alabama general permit for construction stormwater discharge. And uh, we, we talked about the fact that there is a, a new general permit in the state of Alabama that will become effective April 1st. And uh, the Alabama Stormwater Association Tuesday afternoon had a, uh, a, a webinar um, where a couple of folks from, from ADEM showed up and answered questions and provided information about that new, uh, new permit. So I'll show you a couple of slides related to managing sediment uh, from that new permit. Some of these requirements have been there for a while and others may seem uh, a little bit new to you, but just looking at this uh, slide full of words here, um, number five, it, it requires that we complete the installation of, of stormwater controls by the time each phase of construction activities begin. Uh, and, and so a little bit later, we'll talk about construction sequencing and phasing as a part of a, a more comprehensive plan. Uh, and, and so ADEM's talking here about buffers and perimeter controls and stormwater inlet protection and other practices that control, um, control discharges from, uh, from site clearing and, 
uh, grading, excavating, other earth disturbing activities. Uh, so that number five there, it covers initial installation as you're starting, but also the sub subsequent installation of practices after the work gets going. Uh, personally, just a, a personal note here, I don't like the word control when we're talking about stormwater management. Uh, I think that there are, are way too many var variables out there that are, are, are beyond our control. I think that, uh, well, in most things, the, the idea of control is kind of a, an illusion, um, but, but with construction stormwater, oftentimes the, the best we can do is simply manage the processes, manage the work, and that helps us to manage the outcome. So, so I, I think when we use the word control too often, it, it makes us, it makes us and others think that we're better than we are at at, uh, at, at managing construction stormwater. So, uh, just a, a side note there um, that that may may cause you to think a little bit in the future. Uh, so, moving on in that that permit, uh, this this section here talks about uh, uh, it actually requires the minimum minimization of construction related sediment track out. Uh, or the transport of, of sediment on vehicles as they leave a construction site and deposit that uh, that sediment on public roadways. Uh, it, it, this section, it, it covers both the, the prevention of track out and also what, what you're supposed to do when track out happens or the correction of, of that. And, and we're specifically going to talk about construction exit pads as a way to minimize uh, track out um, as we move on today. And then this section 15, it requires the, the protection of storm drain inlets. Uh, inlet protection is, is also one of the three practice areas that we're going to cover today. And, and this section covers uh, installation and maintenance of, of protections uh, for inlets that, uh, that route run off to receiving waters. And that's important to note uh, is uh, we'll, we'll talk later about how sometimes it's more harmful to put inlet protection out than, uh, than it is helpful. And, and that, that's probably making you a little bit nervous hearing me say that, especially you regulators on the phone. But sometimes we can create a problem by, by putting inlet pr protection out. But if we choose to not include inlet protection as a part of our comprehensive plan, we have to make sure that we've got some other type of, of practice or, or management uh, downstream from, from that inlet before it enters the receiving waters. And this, uh, this regulatory language kind of highlights the, the flexibility there in my mind. Uh, this section discusses sediment management uh, related to material stockpiles. Uh, we, we, we first need to, of course, manage our stockpiles by getting them as far away from the receiving waters as we can. And then we try to keep them there, right? We talked next last week about uh, using temporary vegetation to, to stabilize those stockpiles. Uh, and, and this section requires that we also uh, place some type of sediment barrier down gradient from that, uh, from that stockpile to, to make sure that those particles and soil particles and that material stays where it, where it ought to. Um, uh, we, we talked about the uh, coastal zone uh, management requirements, uh, the, the new language in the general permit, and, and this applies to Mobile and Baldwin County specifically. So, so you guys, the, the target audience of this, this workshop, um, there's some new language in there that you probably ought to pay attention to. Uh, not necessarily new requirements. Uh, some of those requirements are already included in the uh, Coastal Zone Management Plan. Uh, but they're they're highlighted and, and a part of regulation, uh, part of this uh, stormwater discharge regula regulation and permit coverage uh, as part of the general permit. Another thing to to highlight is the uh, the definition of best management practice in the in the general permit. I, I don't think this has been updated, but we we just do need a, a reminder to uh, recognize that that this term covers a lot of different things that. So we're talking about implementation and maintenance. We're talking about structural and non-structural and management strategies as being elements of our best practices plan. Uh, and, and we want to, want to make sure that we, we remember that the term best management practice, and it includes the term best. And so as we get better at what we do, which is an expectation and ought to be 
one of our goals as, as professionals, we ought to be getting better at what we do every day. Um, that, that causes the, the face of, of the BMP or, or what a best management practice looks like. It causes that to change over time also. And it, it kind of puts us and the regulator in a little bit of a, a bind as we try to define, okay, what is the best management practice for this particular application today? And so if you think about the, the hay bale, used to be uh, much more prominent on our construction sites, say 10 or 15 years ago, but we've learned in, in some of those practices where we used to use hay bales, we've, we've learned better practices. And so those better practices became best practices along the way. And, and you would struggle to find hay bales on any of the projects I'm responsible for today. And, it's not that uh, they were they were bad practices when they were used. We just uh, we've evolved and, and we've gotten better over the year through years through research and, it, uh, and and through our practice and through paying attention. Uh, we we've we've gotten better, and so um, so even even the regulators uh, have to have to keep an open mind and and have to stay flexible and not stuck in nineteen. 92 or whatever year is safe and, and secure and comfortable for us. Uh, if, if we choose to do that, then uh, one day we'll be rendered irrelevant and that, that ought to scare all of us. So uh, we talked last week, or I'm sorry, last uh, Tuesday about applying the five pillars of construction stormwater management as we create our, our comprehensive stormwater management plan and as we implement that plan. and. Uh, we talked about uh, managing communication and managing work and managing water, managing erosion and managing sediment. I gave you more uh, in the last workshop of the, the evolution of the five pillars than I'm going to go back over today. But know that while this, this workshop series is focused on managing erosion and managing sediment primarily, uh, those two things, we, we can't be effective if that's all we do. First, we've got to manage communication and that's manage communication internally with our own team, manage communication with our, our contractor, manage communication with, with our, our stakeholders, our external stakeholders. And we have to, everyone needs to know what our priorities and our expectations are before we even start the work, before the contractor uh, uh, puts a bid together to, to do the work, they need to know what those expectations are. And, and our contractors, you know, with managing work, we, we've learned that our contractors are capable, they're smart, they're innovative. And if we will tell them up front what we need from them and we're willing to pay for it, they can do just about anything we want them to. But we have to tell them up front. We have to manage communication. And then we have to sometimes dictate how they're going to do the work. You know, our interests and their interests don't always align. Oftentimes they do. But uh, sometimes they do, uh, they do kind of pull apart and we have to make sure that we as the owner or we as the owner's rep representative, that we're looking out for the, the owner's interest. And sometimes we have to tell the contractor how to do it. And that's what managing work is, is all about. We know that uh, at least in the, in the Southeast that uh, erosion, uh, soil erosion is primarily caused by water. And so we, we have found ways to uh, divert and convey water across our site without having to go through our disturbed work area. And, and so we can take that clean water or the, the raindrops that fall on someone else's property, we can convey those through and over and around our project without adding sediment to that. And then that reduces our workload to only having to deal with the raindrops that fall on our site. And, and which is a much more management proposition. And then we can get into to managing erosion and managing sediment. And, and that's what we, we're, we're covering as a part of this workshop series. So in, in related to sediment control or managing sediment specifically, uh, with communication, we have specifications, plan notes, pre-bid and pre-construction meetings. Uh, we can provide uh, direction and clarity regarding our expectations at any point along the way. And I, I think I told you last time that uh, the five pillars can and should be used at, at every stage of, of 
construction and, and project delivery. So during planning, during design, during construction, when I drive up on one of the projects that I'm responsible for, uh, for helping in, in this area of construction stormwater management, I think through those five pillars. Are we talking with our contractor? Does our inspector, our brand new inspector, do they know what to be looking for? Have we talked to the regulator about this, this issue that we had or, or, or may have or the things that we're trying to do? And I walk through those, those five pillars every time I pull up on the job and, and sometimes multiple times as I go from, from location to location within the job, I think through, are we managing communication? Are we managing work? So again, related to sediment control, managing work, uh, the, the timing and installation or the timing of installation of sediment controls is, is critical. And sometimes we have to direct that, hey, before we start this, we've got to do these other things to, to make sure that we're, we're taking care of what we need to take care of. Uh, managing water, runoff can uh, overwhelm sediment controls if, if it's not properly managed. With, with inlet protection in particular, we, we have to make sure that the water that's intended to go in this inlet eventually ends up in this inlet. We don't want it to bypass that inlet, go to the next inlet, go to the next one, and then blow out at the bottom of the hill. We've got to manage that water. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later. Um, we know that managing uh, erosion helps lessen the burden of, of managing sediment. Uh, and then, and then with, with sediment, we know that no matter how effective we are at, at managing the other four pillar, pillars, uh, we can't get away from also managing sediment. We, we, even if it's just a, um, just a backup for us, we've got to make sure that we, we're protecting the perimeter, we're protecting those inlets, we're, we're making sure that our sediment stays on our project. Um, and that's, that's ultimately a goal for managing sediment is to just, just one last check are we keeping sediment on our project? So Mike, uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I'm, oh, I should have clicked through that, sorry. So turn it back over to Mike Perez and um, hopefully you can click through those slides. Okay. Looks like I, I'm able to. All right. Thanks Barry. So uh, we'll start off with talking about construction entry or exit pads. Uh, and I actually like to refer to them as, uh, as exit pads uh, because that's their purpose. You're trying to capture sediment that might be uh, caked on the tires or wheels of equipment uh, before they leave the site. Uh, they also serve to help direct traffic in, in, into the site and give a, a, an area where traffic should be going in and out of. If we look at the permit and we look at the Alabama Blue Book, uh, one of the requirements of our stormwater pollution prevention plan is that we have to minimize the track out from our job site. And so the construction general permit tells us that we should be using the appropriate stabilization techniques on all construction entrances and exits that lead to a paved road. We also have to restrict vehicle use to these, these designated entrances and exits. And if these exits and entrances are not enough, we may have to implement additional track out controls uh, to ensure that we're removing the sediment before a vehicle exits the site. And so uh, we have to avoid the track out of soil onto roads. And there's a couple of different purposes for this. Obviously from an aesthetic standpoint, um, it, it doesn't look great when you have soil tracked out, but there's also a public safety concern uh, Debris and sediment uh, could be tracked by vehicles that could cause uh, conditions where it makes driving uh, hazardous for the public. Uh, but then the third aspect of this too is environmental welfare. Um, many of our roads drain directly to a, a catch basin or they, they drain into a receiving water. And so this becomes a direct source for that sediment to, uh, to quickly get into a receiving water body. You know, having a, a situation like this where you have sediment tracked out onto the road this is basically an open invitation for the public to complain and for a inspector to come check out what else is wrong on your job site. So in order to uh, minimize track out and to control access and egress into the job site, we rely on primarily on construction uh, exit pads. And these exit pads are typically constructed out of stone. 
And so the stone uh, base is designed to provide the buffer area between the job site and the public roadway. Uh, and it's also an opportunity for us to capture mud and any caked on soil uh, that can be easily removed from uh, construction vehicles before they leave the site. There are several design resources available for us to, when it comes to properly designing, constructing, inspecting, and maintaining a construction exit pad. And uh, the one we'll be talking about primarily in this workshop today is coming from the Alabama Blue Book or the Handbook. Uh, but realize that the Alabama DOT also has some really good resources available uh, for properly implementing a construction exit pad. If we look at the design specifications from the Alabama Blue Book, we're told that at minimum, our construction exit pad should have a length of about 50 feet. We should be using Alabama DOT number one stone. And most importantly, we should also be using a geotextile fabric under the aggregate. Now, the reason why we use a number one stone is because that particular gradation, which is about two to four inches in size, each, each rock, uh, that gradation tends to not compact as well. And so it just tends to remain loose. Over time, it will uh, compact and you'll have to come back in and, um, and add additional stone or, or clean out that area. Uh, but the number one stone also is it's not easy to track out from the site. If you were to use a smaller size stone, like a 57 stone, uh, you know, that has a tendency of, of tracking out with vehicle tires. And then anything larger, if you start getting into the size of like riprap, um, you know, if that happens to, to track out from the job site, that could create, create hazardous driving conditions. Um, so the number one stone has been, it, it seems to work pretty well for this purpose. And, um, and that is the, the recommended stone size. This is a, a cross section showing you the typical construction exit pad. Uh, if you go by the, the blue book, you, you need to provide at least a minimum of six inches of depth to your construction exit pad. And a typical width is about 20 feet. And there's a couple of different options. You can either build it above grade or you can uh, build it below grade I show on the bottom. But you should always have that geotextile and, and typically what's recommended is the eight ounce non-woven uh, geotextile. And what that geotextile does is it helps separate the soil beneath the rock uh, from the construction exit pad. And so that gives you a little bit more uh, longevity, uh, reduces the amount of sediment that, that gets caked into the, uh, to the aggregate and help prevent some of it from sinking into the ground too far. Here's an example of the Alabama DOT uh, construction exit pad. And the major difference between uh, the DOT exit pad and the Alabama handbook or the Alabama blue book exit pad is in the depth or the height of the stone required. And so you see here that you know, DOT requires 12 inches of, of aggregate, still the same stone size and still have the geotextile underline. But the purpose for having more depth is because a highway job site typically has a little bit more traffic in and out and you tend to have heavier vehicles coming in and out. So that additional uh, rock helps provide some, some added longevity to the system. Where possible, you should construct your construction exit pad to slope away from the road. And what this allows is when it rains, you know, any sediment that has accumulated on the exit pad, um, if you have it sloping away from the public road, uh, this helps contain that sediment within the job site limits and it prevents that sediment from being uh, washed out into the roadway. Now, all job sites don't allow you to do this. You have to have the right settings, the right configuration, but if at all possible, you should try to construct it away from uh, the roadway. You know, also think about how to uh, transition uh, onto the paved roadway. So here, this is in an urban environment um, and you've got a sidewalk and then you've got a curb drop. Um, so here, you know, coming up with a system where uh, you can create that transition might become important. Um, but you also have to think about the, the job site restraints and constraints that you might have. And so that's not always possible. Here you have an example of what is a, an urban or a, a rural connection uh, to a job site. Uh, you can see they've, they're crossing a swale. And so they've put in a, a corrugated pipe to serve as a culvert, um, lined the underlay of the uh, aggregate pad with a geotextile. And then you've got the connection from the job site onto the public road. And this is, a, is actually a DOT standard that you can uh, use. This is a, 
what's called the rural connection detail. You still have your 12 inches of aggregate and then you have your underlay uh, and then you add your, your drain pipe, your, um, uh, your culvert to allow flow through that swale. And here's another shot of it, another example of one. Now the length on this particular exit pad is probably not long enough. You might want to extend it a little bit further in. Um, you want to try to achieve at least 50 feet uh, to allow enough uh, rotations of the vehicle tires to, uh, to come in contact with the rock. To give you a general idea on cost for construction exit pads, um, you know, one, one thing to realize is down in Baldwin, Baldwin and Mobile counties, you have some of the higher rock prices in the state. And so it's actually the, the two uh, most expensive counties when you look at the state average for, for the rock, uh, you're about 56% higher than the typical or the state average for the price of, of rock. Uh, and that's just due to availability down there. Uh, but if you were to construct your exit pad based on the blue book uh, guidance, you're looking at about 1.2 tons uh, or 64 tons total. So it's 1.2 tons per yard, about 18 and a half yards, um, at $64 a ton delivered. You get about $1,500 just in rock. And then you can add another um, 150 bucks, 125 bucks or so for the geotextile underlay. If you're going with double the depth, the, the DOT 12 inches, uh, you, essentially, you're doubling your price, almost $3,000 for a 50-foot long, 20-foot wide construction exit pad. Now, we have uh, manufactured or proprietary type of construction exit pads that we can also use. Uh, this is a particular product, which is constructed out of plastic. Um, it's very heavy duty. I've had a chance to play around with it and, and, and see it. And um, the idea is that it serves the same purpose. You're agitating the tires, flexing the tires, causing that, um, that sediment to drop from the tire um, as the vehicle is rolling or driving past it. Now, one of the neat advantages that this particular system has is that from a maintenance standpoint, uh, you can bring a broom sweeper on a, on a skid steer and you can sweep this, uh, this device clean. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier from a maintenance standpoint and, you know, it is reusable where you can lift these up and take them from job site to job site. Um, installation is pretty simple where you just you lay them down and you drive a nail or a stake or a large rebar uh, through the corners of it. Um, so they, they, it's an alternative to having aggregate and in some areas where cost of aggregate may be prohibitive, this could be a, a good alternative. And so here's a close up showing you how uh, those plastic extrusions from the, the device, they, they help uh, reach into those areas between the, the tire uh, treads and uh, grab on some of that sediment and agitate it and, and encourage it to drop off. All right, you know, there's several different types of manufactured products. Uh, this is one that's constructed out of recycled rubber. Um, and these are again, portable mats so you can move around. Uh, but same idea, agitate those tires, encourage that sediment to drop off. And uh, you can see there's some areas between those rubber mats where uh, sediment can accumulate and uh, be captured. Uh, the Blue Book also provides guidance on using uh, metal or steel plates. So these are uh, steel bars that have been welded together to, to create a track out control device. Um, here you're using it in combination with aggregate and you can see there's also a dedicated storage area below the plates uh, to capture some of that uh, soil that may drop off. Here's another version of a, of a manufactured uh, metal plate system. Here's one that has a connection to uh, the roadway. So if you're looking for that transition between the job site and, and, uh, and getting off the curb, um, this particular option may be suitable for that. Uh, you'll notice here with that uh, silt fence, that orange silt fence, uh, going around, what they're, what they're doing here is they're directing traffic in and out of that construction exit pad. So a contractor can't drive around and bypass it. You know, they're, they're really forced uh, to drive through it. And here's a, a close-up showing you how those steel plates are welded on there in a manner where it's going to encourage that sediment to, to drop from the tire. Now, sometimes these passive methods are, are not sufficient enough to remove all the sediment that may be caked on, a, on vehicle tires. And so you may wanna consider using washing uh, or wash station 
uh, if those gravel pads and if those uh, other manufactured practices are not sufficient. So something as simple as using a power washer uh, to, to wash those tires before they leave the site would be sufficient. Uh, but we also have you know, these fancy manufactured uh, wheel wash systems uh, that can be brought out to a site. You know, these are typically rented out, um, but these provide you know, a very active means of, of washing those vehicle tires and uh, any loose debris that may be on a, on a vehicle. You know, they also have some that are used on industrial plants or used for uh, concrete plants where you can remove any dust or any, um, any loose particles that are on those vehicles. It's just a video clip showing you uh, how these systems work. Uh, you can see that they have high pressure nozzles throughout. So they're not only blowing down from the bottom, uh, but they're also shooting from the sides and up above uh, to try to remove as much sediment as possible. And you can see, you know, this particular install is more on a, on a industrial site. It's more of a permanent feature on their, on their site before those trucks leave. Uh, but one important thing to point out with these as this video is demonstrating is that you have to collect all of this water that you're spraying on. All of this wash water is now contaminated with sediment. So uh, you have to direct that water into a sediment basin or some other type of treatment uh, so that you can treat it before you discharge it. And so uh, the permit tells us and the, the blue book tells us that if you do use wash water uh, for cleaning tires, you must divert it to a trap or a basin where it can be treated before offsite discharge. Hey Mike, before you leave that uh, there, just remember if you've got uh, water being sprayed up under the, the chassis of, of the vehicle, you may have oils and grease also that uh, you might have to, to do some additional treatment, not just into a sediment basin. So if, you're, if your intent is to remove sediment, then try to only remove sediment, then treat that. But just know that if you're, uh, if you're pressure washing up under a vehicle, you're probably going to get some oil and grease that creates another problem for you. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up, Barry. You know, something to consider as well is that there may be some enforcement necessary when it comes to exit pads. Um, so you can see this was a job site in Atlanta I visited a few months ago, and I found it, I was, I was pretty surprised that we're using one of these manufactured devices, which was, was neat to see it out on the job site. But what I also noticed was that the uh, truck drivers preferred not to drive on it because it, it's not comfortable to drive on, right? It's not as smooth as as driving over just the, the dirt. Um, but here, you know, is a great example of how you may need to enforce those vehicles to drive over um, those exit pads, you know, have some kind of barricade directing them to drive over them and, and rather than driving around. Um, you know, this particular day, the, it was pretty dry out there and uh, there wasn't a lot of mud being tracked out. Uh, but if this becomes, you know, common practice during a rainy day, uh, I could, you know, that interstate would, uh, would have a lot of sediment on it. And if you do happen to have sediment track out from uh, the job site, we're required by the permit to remove that sediment by the end of the same business day. So that sediment is not allowed to be on the street uh, you know, after that uh, project closes down for the day. We have a couple of different options that we can use uh, for removing any tracked out sediment. We can sweep, uh, we can shovel by hand, or we can use a vacuum truck uh, to remove that sediment. You know, one thing that we're not allowed to do is to wash any tracked out sediment into a storm drain. Um, if, you, if, you're have, if you're able to, uh, the, what you want to do is collect that sediment before it gets into any storm drain. You're, you're not allowed to hose it down, you're not allowed to wash it down, especially if it's getting out to a, a, a water of the state. And so that brings us to our, our first poll question, um, asking us if aggregate-based construction exit pads should include a geotextile underlay. So this is just to check if you've been uh, paying attention, uh, but as, as we're seeing here, everybody so far has been responding that uh, we should be using that geotextile underlay. And so keep in mind that the underlay provides a, an important purpose. It helps separate that aggregate base from um, the soil underneath. Uh, not only does it provide separation, but also helps on the longevity of that rock. You know, if you prevent the rock from sinking into the dirt, into the mud, uh, it's gonna have a longer usable lifespan. Mike, uh, while, we're, while you're talking about that, uh, so, so yeah, if you don't have that, that separation geotextile, ge your, your rock has a tendency to go down into the, 
into the mud, but the mud also has a tendency to pump up into your aggregate. And, and like Mike said, that uh, as, you, as you maintain that, you'll start to add more and more aggregate. So as uh, Mike talked about costs earlier and pointed out about a $3,000 installation uh, for, for that Aldot typical, um, know that that only covers the initial installation. So uh, if, if you're budgeting, if you're, if you're putting together an estimate for your project, you're gonna have to include some, some work to refresh that rock, not just to, to, to loosen it up, which is one way to refresh it, but also to add some clean aggregate uh, later on. So there needs to be cost included uh, with that. And, and so uh, the filter separation GFX stock can actually uh, help save you some money or maybe reduce the amount of maintenance and costs associated with that. Great, thanks Barry. So we'll move on now to uh, sediment barriers. This will be our second practice that we're covering today. And so when we think of a sediment barrier, you know, we look at the definition, it's a temporary structure. It's used across a landscape to reduce the quantity of sediment that's moving down slope. And the purpose of using a sediment barrier is to intercept sheet, sheet flow, uh, reduce runoff velocity, which minimizes erosive energy and to impound runoff allowing for sedimentation. Now notice here that in our definition and in our purpose, you don't see the word filter. And oftentimes we think of sediment barriers, especially silt fence as a filter, uh, but we need to, to realize that that's not how they work. The primary function is to reduce runoff velocity and then impound the runoff, creating conditions that are favorable for particles to settle out. And so we have a variety of tools in our toolbox for sediment barriers. We can rely on berms, we've got brush barriers, we can use compost filter socks, we can use hay bales, sandbags over impervious areas. We have sediment retention barriers, silt fence, which I'd say is most popular. We've got vegetative buffers, wattles, and then a variety of other manufactured and proprietary uh, practices and, and devices that I've seen on job sites. Uh, the DOT has a, several uh, sediment barrier options that uh, that are used. Uh, they rely on brush barriers. We've got wattles to create temporary berms, uh, silt fence, uh, again, very popular. And then over impervious areas, such as parking lots, you can see sandbags being used. An important item to note is that when you're using sediment barriers, these should be uh, installed uh, early on in the construction period before any major earth disturbing activities have begun. So the permit does allow you to clear uh, small amounts of area if you're installing uh, sediment barriers or if you're installing your sediment basins and your track out control systems. Uh, but you cannot create or you cannot start disturbing a large amount of land until you've had those controls installed. Uh, a few considerations to keep in mind uh, as you're installing sediment barriers is that you want all these barriers to be constructed on the contour. It's important to make it so that it's important important to put them on the contour uh, so that you don't over concentrate the loads on the barriers uh, causing overtopping uh, or minimizing the available storage capacity that the, device, that the devices have. You also want to turn the ends of the sediment barriers upslope to help prevent any runoff from bypassing around the ends of the barrier. And you want to prevent scour, erosion, and any undermining uh, underneath the sediment barrier to make sure you can maintain the maximum impoundment capability of the device. So let's start off by looking at silt fence, which again is one of the more popular practices used for sediment barrier applications. And so the silt fence has a few different functions. Uh, the idea is that it's going to provide a temporary sediment barrier, help form that impoundment that creates conditions that are favorable for those soil particles to settle out of suspended uh, water. Um, Use a geotextile material. So this is, uh, it could be a woven or non-woven. We have a couple of different options here in the state. The silt fence is gonna be anchored and supported by post. And those could be uh, steel or wood, depending on the type of silt fence configuration we're installing. And then we're also seeing silt fence with and without additional reinforcement. Uh, that could be a wire backed or a polypropylene backed uh, type of silt fence installation. The blue book provides us some guidance on the selection of uh, silt fence or the, the placement of silt fence based on the steepness and the slope length uh, upstream. And so if we think about this, you know, this would be an embankment type of situation or a fill slope. Um, and then based on the steepness of that slope, we're, we're limited 
uh, to how long that slope can be. Um, and what we want to do is, you know, in this particular installation here, uh, you've got the sill fence right at the toe of the embankment, but this minimizes the available amount of impoundment that you can achieve upstream. And so it's advantageous to move that silt fence further back if right away exists or if you have space on the job site so that you can maximize the volume that can be stored upstream. You know, think of these as temporary detention areas where storing that water and delaying its discharge improves the water quality and helps capture sediment particles. An additional guidance that we have from the Alabama Blue Book uh, is that for um, unreinforced silt fence, you can treat about a quarter acre of drainage area for every hundred feet of fence. And we can double that for reinforced silt fence. So we have wire backed or polypropylene backed. We can treat about half an acre of the drainage area per hundred feet, per hundred linear feet of silt fence. So that's another design consideration to have in mind. In general, we should avoid using silt fence um, in concentrated flow uh, areas. So you never want to place silt fence or other type of sediment barriers for that matter uh, across a stream, within a ditch, a waterway, or any other areas will have concentrated flow. Now there is an exception to that, and we've been able to show through research here at our testing facility uh, that if you do properly design and install a silt fence, it can be used for channelized flow. And so here's an example of a silt fence ditch check uh, installation that we've helped develop at the facility for the Alabama DOT. But you can see we've included additional reinforcement. You've got tighter post spacing, and then you've got a weir that helps dictate where the stormwater, where the runoff is going to be uh, overtopping. We have two primary types of silt fence material we use in the state. We've got non-woven and we have woven silt fence. Uh, the non-woven silt fence will be the Alabama Blue Book Type A silt fence or the Alabama DOT silt fence. Uh, this is approximately four ounces per square yard. Um, and, uh, and it's a non-woven material that doesn't have as high a flow through. We also have a woven option uh, they have a variety of flow through rates depending on the manufacturer type and the design of the woven fabric. And this is what we refer to uh, as part of our handbook type B or Alabama Blue Book type B silk fence. So if we start with the type A silk fence, uh, we look at the typical materials. You have a 36 to 44 inch non-woven geotextile. Your posts should be steel posts and they should have a weight of a minimum of 1.25 pounds per foot. We've tested lighter weight T-posts and it does make a very significant difference on the structural integrity of the silt fence. The 1.25 is important to have. At a minimum, uh, the post should be five foot in length and that it gives you enough room or enough depth to, uh, to drive that post deep into the ground. The spacing between posts should be at a maximum of 10 feet and in areas where you have concentrated flow, you should be spacing them at five foot. The reinforcement for a type A silt fence would be a woven wire fence of 14 gauge. The blue book says that you need a minimum of six by six inch spacings on that uh, wire back, but the DOT allows up to a 12 inch spacing on the, on the wire reinforcement. And like I mentioned, anytime you have an impoundment that's uh, expected to have a significant amount of volume, the maximum post spacing you should consider is five foot. So you would want to add an additional post in between those 10 foot spacings. Uh, when it comes to the installation of your type A silt fence, you want to uh, embed uh, your post into the ground at least 24 inches. The silt fence itself should be anywhere from uh, 24 to 32 inches in height above the ground. And then you want to compact and uh, trench in, or you want to trench in and compact your uh, silt fence into the ground. On your type B, your type B silt fence is going to have a woven 36 inch wide geotextile. We have a few different options when it comes to post. We can use softwood, either a three inch diameter dowel or a two by four. If you're using hardwood like oak, you can get away with a one and a half inch by one and a half inch post. You can also use steel posts. Again, you should be using the one and a quarter pound foot um, uh, steel post. A minimum of four foot length on your post. And when it comes to spacing, you're looking at anywhere between four and six feet. Your type B is gonna be reinforced with a polypropylene backing. 
you can see here on your post, you want to drive these at least 18 inches into the ground and you have at least 24 inches of fabric above ground. And you're also trenching in your sill fence and a six inch by six inch trench and coming back and compacting the soil around it. Now, one innovative approach that we've helped develop here at our test facility is what we call the offset trench. And you can see here what we've done is we've installed our T-post six inches behind the trench that we've dug out for the silt fence. And so what this allows you to do is to install your silt fence into the trench and then wrap it back over the ground before it comes up over those posts. And so what that does is that allows you to install those T-posts in native soil where you, or undisturbed soil uh, where you have basically an additional six inches of support in the ground. And then it also allows you to have, um, it also allows that water as it's impounding to sit on top of the silt fence. As you can see here, that water will sit there and provide additional force to anchor that silt fence geotextile out of the ground. And so now the DOT has adopted this particular uh, installation technique. Uh, we've also proposed one for slicing. So if you slice the silt fence, you can actually slice it six inches off of the T-post and have the same type of configuration. And so here's an example of slicing. You know, one thing to keep in mind is with, with slicing is that uh, it does increase your productivity significantly. And uh, one of the advantages to it as well is that you're minimizing the disturbance of the soil upstream of the silt fence. So instead of trenching in or disturbing a six inch by six inch trench, uh, you provide a very small profile uh, where you're entrenching that silt fence and, and pushing it down into the ground. They also have uh, slicing uh, uh, machines or equipment for wire back silt fence. So it's not just the, uh, not just the type B, but you can also slice in your type A. Uh, you'll notice you still have to come back and manually uh, add your T-post and, uh, and tie that um, silt fence to the T-post. So there still is some, some manual process involved with it. Another important topic when it comes to, uh, to silt fence installation that I see wrong many times, or I frequently see this being uh, incorrectly done on a job site, is when it comes to splicing the ends of your rolls. You know, just overlapping you know, your silt fence rolls or overlapping the segments is not sufficient to keep water from flowing between the silt fences. And so this is a, an example of a poorly installed splice and what the Alabama handbook instructs us to do is to take those two end posts, wrap them together before we drive them into the ground and then drive those two posts together. So you create a seamless uh, splice between the ends of the roll. And so here's a couple examples of a properly uh, spliced installation. The placement of silk fence is also very important. We wanna make sure that our silk fence is gonna be perpendicular to the flow direction um, where possible, install them on the contour. But then, you know, in some areas, you may not be able to do it on the contour. And so what we can do is we can create uh, what are called smile configurations or C configurations uh, to limit the, uh, the area or limit the, the amount of impoundment you have in a single segment of silt fence. Uh, another option we have is to use J-hooks. And so here's a, here are examples of the smile or the C and the J-hook. And you can see what this does is this, it limits the amount of water that's going to be detained in each one of those particular um, uh, silt fence segments. And so the advantage to this is if you have uh, overtopping, uh, you know, it's overtopping in a designated spot, it's going to be at the lowest point of that particular install. Um, if you do have excessive amount of flows that cause a failure, you're only going to fail or you're only going to have failure on one of those segments versus having it on the entire length of the silt fence. Um, and water is going to tend to go to the lowest spot anyway. Uh, having it on the contour is not always going to be achievable. Uh, so these are very uh, useful practices that we can use. Here's an example of uh, J-hooks on a roadway embankment. And you can see these are set up to capture stormwater um, coming off of the slope. And as that water impounds, it'll uh, be stored in those individual catchments. Now it's important to extend uh, the, the J part of the hook far up enough so that water doesn't flow around the end of the J-hook and onto the next uh, uh, catch, catchment area. You want water to stay confined into that J-hook and if it does, tend, if it does happen to overtop, uh, have a dedicated area for it to do that uh, right behind that silt fence. Mike, uh, just really quickly, uh, one thing to note in this photo is just pay attention to what we're protecting here. 
we're trying to keep sediment out of this riprap line channel. This is a, a case where we're not, we haven't installed the sediment barrier at the perimeter. Uh, so just know that that we can use sediment barrier for for other things. It's not just uh, not just for perimeters anymore. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, an example of a C configuration here, you can see the ends of that sill fence have been brought up so that you don't have water flowing around the edges of the of the sill fence configuration, and you're um, confining all the storage to the front of that of that sill fence. Another innovative uh, approach that we've developed here at our test facility is using a dewatering board and an overflow weir. Um, so one thing we noticed in our testing uh, is that from a longevity standpoint, the silt fence fabric tends to blind or tends to clog and really restrict the amount of flow through the system. And so we would run tests where we'd have water uh, impounded for 24, 48 hours, basically until we pumped water out from in front of the silt fence. And so we realized that it was important to include a mechanism where we could control the dewatering rate of the silt fence. And so what you see here is this, it's basically a two by four uh, that's been cut out with orifices that allow a very controlled amount of flow to leave uh, from that dedicated spot. And then up above, you've got a V-notch weir uh, that creates a low spot in the installation so that if you do have excessive flow or excessive storage, uh, you do have a release mechanism for that water to uh, to safely or controlled or to leave in a controlled fashion. And then downstream, it's important to uh, have some sort of scour protection so that you don't create issues from that water overtopping. So using a geotextile underlay, using some riprap will help dissipate that flow as it's as it's overtopping the silt fence. Um, you know, using a system like this helps decrease your dewatering time. So this if this silt fence was completely full, it would dewater in about four hours. Um, and we saw that it had little to no effect on uh, the treatment capabilities of the silt fence from a, a turbidity standpoint. We still achieved similar amounts of uh, turbidity removal or sediment removal upstream of the device. And so now this has become, as of January, um, part of the Alabama DOT standard silt fence installation. Uh, so it's neat to see some of our research being implemented here in the state. Uh, you're also seeing the, the offset trench, um, and you've got that, it's important to add that uh, apron in the back uh, to allow for uh, protection from scour uh, where that, uh, that bead notch weir is located on your sill fence installation. Another really neat installation uh, approach for silt fence is what's called the super duty silt fence, and this is a Minnesota DOT approach. But what they do is they use jersey barriers as their structural support. So rather than using a T post, uh, they'll install their, they will install their silt fence over concrete Jersey barriers. Uh, and they use this in areas where they can have a large amount of impoundment or here they were using it for, to manage a stockpile. Hey Mike, uh, if I could add, add something here, just uh, so as we're thinking about sediment barriers uh, and, and silt fence, notice that uh, all we've replaced here with these concrete barriers, and I've, I've used this this application before and it works great where you need some some additional reinforcement so so the concrete barrier just really it gave you some more structure you've still got the same uh, fabric material on the front you've just got some more structure on the back and and so we, we talked a little bit about brush barriers earlier that's not just a pile of uh, pile of trees that have been cut down that helps a little bit but if you're going to call it a brush barrier and and want to be paid for it and think that it might be effective, you're gonna need that, that fabric face on the front of it that, that goes under it and then up the face. So, so no, we're, we're really just talking about different, uh, different heights and strengths of what we would consider silt fence. It's just got a, a more structure behind it with this and the brush barrier and other things where we wrap that face, even, even aggregate uh, barriers. If we wrap that face uh, with the fabric, that, that can help also. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Barry, and I'm seeing I've got a handful of slides here, and then it might be a good time to take our five-minute break. Right. Um, so one thing we do discourage with silt fence is uh, when it comes to creating diversions uh, for for runoff or for water entering your site. You know, silt fence is not the best approach for that. Uh, it could, it could create conditions where you have undermining and scour, uh, and it's not an appropriate use for it. 
the other um, the other discouragement is to use silt fence to completely delineate a project limit uh, or to control access to and from uh, the silt fence, the the job site. Uh, you know, there's other ways of doing that. You can use construction fencing, uh, and that's more effective. It's and uh, you know it keeps you from having to inspect an additional practice. Um, and, and, it's, and it's using, you know, restrict the use of silt fence and sediment barriers for their designed uh, application. Uh, other approaches to sediment barriers that we have uh, commonly used here in the state is a double row of silt fence with mulch. Uh, so this is two rows of, of silt fence and then in between you'd add straw bales. Um, the bales help provide reinforcement for the silt fence. Uh, there could be some sort of filtration occurring through it. Um, Here's a, a detail from the Alabama DOT. You can see it's a standard silt fence insulation, and then just in between you're adding uh, two rows of those hay bales. And you may have to have additional wire uh, and anchors to support that system. Here's a view from the top. You wanna make sure you interlock those straw bales so, that don't, so they don't move or that you minimize the amount of water that can flow between the bales themselves. Here's one that has loose mulch rather than straw bales. Another example. We also have sediment retention barriers called out in the blue book. So these would be two rows of high flow through netting. Uh, in between those two rows, you have multiple layers of mulch. And what you do with the SRB is you add granular PAM within each layer. Uh, you also add a downstream jute netting and uh, that's also dosed with PAM, and that jute netting helps act as a, a capture mechanism for any sediment that's been dosed with the uh, polyacrylamide. The purpose is to treat sheet flow as it passes through the SRB and to also actively dose it with PAM. Um, the important thing to note with these is that you do have to have some sort of downstream control anytime you are adding polyacrylamide or flocculant uh, to a barrier. And so here's some examples of um, the SRBs installed Here's one at our testing facility. You can see this has a very high flow through netting. Uh, it's completely see-through. It's basically just there to keep the straw in place and keep it from washing out. So this is a picture during a test and you can see the impoundment capabilities of it is pretty low. You're not impounding any water upstream, uh, but it is acting as a, a good way of uh, treating that water, polishing that storm water um, as it's flowing through and coming into contact with polyacrylamide. So this would be I would recommend a practice like this, maybe downstream of a silt fence uh, after you've captured your, your heavy soil particles that settle out quickly because those tend to flow through this system. Uh, we also have brush or, and, or brush and fabric barriers that we can use. Typically you would use leftover debris from the clearing and grubbing stages. You would pile them up three to six feet high and then you would wrap these brush barriers with the geotextile uh, to decrease the amount of flow through that you would have through the system. You still want to impound water upstream. Are you looking at uh, two acres of contributing area as the maximum for these? Uh, one year maximum design life. And then you still want to provide maintenance like you would with any other type of sediment barrier practices. Uh, typically once half the capacity has been compromised. You want to install these as well on the contour and then turn the ends upstream. And you can see here an example of a brush barrier. Uh, this one doesn't have a geotextile uh, overlay, but that would be important to add as well. I, I haven't seen too many compost berms or socks used here in the state. Uh, they were popular in Iowa when I was up there. Uh, you know, the, the advantage to having compost is that you could reuse it on the site and spread it. It makes a good topsoil. Um, it's good for, for germinating seeds. It's good for establishing plants. And these are uh, constructed on site. They can be blown in. Um, you know, you can purchase these uh, these socks, or you can you can actually manufacture them on the site. And so, here's an example of blowing in the material, the compost, into the sock. Um, you know, and typically on a job site, you've got one guy working, five guys watching, as demonstrated here. Um, you can also stack these together to create a, a larger barrier, create more impoundment. And that's, a, that's probably a good pausing point for us there. Let's, let's take a five minute break before we get into inlet protection. 
And so Barry, what do you say? Maybe if we get back at 1020, that'd be a good spot for us. Yes, we, we've got a long way to go. So please be back at 1021 about that. All right, now I've got 1020, so I think this is a, a good point for us to, to continue. And you know, the next practice, the third practice we're going to be talking about is inlet protection. And inlet protection is one of my favorite uh, sediment control practices because I had the opportunity to, to do research on them as a master's student uh, working here at Auburn. And so uh, the purpose of inlet protection is to provide a practice or a measure that helps remove the coarse sediment particles from discharge prior to entry into any inlet uh, that routes stormwater flow from the site. The key word or the key terms here is that coarse sediment particles. Uh, we cannot effectively reduce turbidity or remove your fine soil particles with inlet protection practices. So inlet protection provides a means for us to temporarily, um, or, or it's a temporary means for us to implement during construction with the goal of preventing sediment from washing it into the inlet and they function by settlement. So you create conditions that are favorable, you impound those, you impound runoff and sediment's gonna settle out. Again, not a filtration mechanism, it's a mechanism to temporarily impound and capture your large uh, soil particles. And these are required by the construction general permit. We're also told that we should limit the drainage area to our inlet protection practices by, to, to a, um, a maximum of one acre. 
The DOT categorizes inland protection into four different stages. Uh, so stage one would be when you have your, um, your pipes or your uh, connections to your manhole uh, installed, but you don't have the actual uh, structure in place yet. You don't have the manhole in place. So what you're doing here is you're trying to provide you know, uh, a little bit of detention before water gets into those uh, connection pipes, um, have a ditch check in place to slow the velocity of water as it comes into that excavated sump area. Your stage two will be once you've uh, installed or you've started installing your structure, your uh, collection structure, uh, you still have an excavated sump. So you are providing uh, protection by having a little bit of impoundment before water gets into um, that inlet box. And you can also provide a barrier, a sediment barrier around uh, the inlet protection practice or the inlet protection or the inlet device. Your stage three would be once you're at grade and you've backfilled your inlet box and you're now able to construct an inlet protection practice directly around uh, the inlet, the throat of the, uh, of the catch basin. And your stage four would be if you have an impervious surface such as a concrete flume uh, where you would have to work around the limits of, uh, of the concrete that's been placed or you're placing a barrier on top of the concrete. We've tested a variety of inlet protection practices here at Auburn. Uh, we looked at silt fence, aggregate barriers, wattle barriers, sandbag barriers, and we also looked at a variety of manufactured devices. Um, I'm sharing with you here some of the modifications that we made to these uh, devices, which we showed were effective at improving the amount of impoundment and the capabilities of these barriers. And so when it comes to wattle barriers, a recommendation we have is to add a geotextile underlay to prevent undermining and scour. Uh, use a TP staking technique. And in addition to the TP staking, you should be adding uh, staples, sod staples to both the front and the back face of the wattle to help create intimate contact between the wattle and the surface of the, of the channel. And so from an impoundment standpoint, you can see here that you're able to impound stormwater around the outside of the barrier uh, the idea is to have overtopping. This shows us that you know, we're effectively collecting water around the outside of the barrier and we're creating those conditions that are favorable for settling. So this, um, this is a good installation showing you how this device should be working. With silt fence, you know, this is very typical on a job site. I'm sure there are plenty of silt fence throughout the state that have done this this week. Uh, but T-Post by themselves, we've shown that it's, it's not an effective means of support uh, for silt fence uh, so, uh, or silt fence inlet protection practices. And so what we really need to do is reinforce that silt fence. And, and one way to do this is by using a two by four. So you can use two by four to um, uh, tighten your installation together. Uh, you have cross braces here that can be installed as well. And this is done by just taking two by four and drilling inch and a half holes where your T-post um, will be uh, inserted. You can then come back and add your wire backing and your uh, geotextile to the installation. So this is a, a time lapse showing you how this particular installation can have, um, you know, can create the full impoundment of the structure. Uh, there's no deflection in the installation. It's very uh, robust and very strong from a structural standpoint. But like our sediment barrier uh, practice, we also realize we need a way for water to flow through. Um, so we have a dewatering board that we've included in the back. It's basically a two by four that has holes drilled in and it's stapled onto the geotextile, and that allows that area to dewater in an effective period of time to where you don't have a con excessive impoundment within a channel or within a, around an inlet uh, where it could create conditions where you can't work in that area or um, hazardous conditions from a, a driving standpoint. You can see here, you've got a lot of sediment that's uh, caked onto the fabric itself, but if you pay attention to the channel, there's a whole lot more sediment that's been collected within the channel. And that sediment is there because of the impoundment that was created. You've reduced the velocity of the, of the flow. Uh, you've created these conditions that are, again, favorable for settling. When it comes to sandbag barriers, uh, what we recommend is installing bags. Uh, you install three rows of bags. Uh, the bottom row are two bags in width. Uh, and then you have a rotated bag in the middle, rotated layer. And then your top bag is a, your top row is a single bag parallel to the bottom row. So uh, three rows, six foot diameter, and the middle row is rotated. 
And the important thing here is to also have that geotextile so that you prevent undermining. If you are using an earthen area, if you're on concrete or uh, impervious area, you don't need that geotextile. But this gives you a good cutaway of how those bags should be oriented. And what this does is it improves the friction between the bags and helps prevent them from, uh, from washing in or, or sliding off like we saw if you put them all parallel. And so here's a picture during, uh, during testing. You can see that we're achieving what we want. Um, our goal here is to impound as much water as we, as we possibly can. Um, and then you, the lowest spot is gonna have overtopping and it's gonna have flow going into the earth. So this is an effective um, installation here. And you can see that geotextile, even extending the geotextile within the inside of the, of the installation, that helps prevent scour as that water is flowing over top of those bags. Another practice you'll find in the Alabama Blue Book is the block and gravel setup. So block and gravel uses a geotextile underlay. It has a, uh, a two rows of concrete block, um, uh, cinder blocks, eight by eight by 16. Those are stacked uh, throughout the inside to create a barrier. Uh, one foot top width on your 57 stone that backfills the installation and then a one-to-one -one side slope on that. What you do is you take one block on the back and you turn it on its side and that helps you uh, have dewatering. We found that without that overturn block, this would again, just impound water for a significant period of time. So you do need to have some control dewatering. And so this block, what we've done is we've only cut out a quarter of the total opening area um, with that geotextile that's wrapped in front of it. And we've also added a hardware cloth to prevent the rock from washing in. Uh, but you can see here, you know, when you install this properly, you can get full impoundment. You still have that dewatering going through. And so um, it's a very effective practice for capturing your heavy soil particles. And again, you know, notice your sediment is not caked onto the, the 57 stone. It's, it's being deposited within the channel upstream uh, because we're slowing that water down. If we compare these standard practices, you can see from a cost standpoint, um, you know, they're, they're not too far off. Uh, from each other. You can see the sandbags might be your cheapest uh, at about $85 for that configuration. And then your higher end would be the aggregate based practices, especially, you know, down in South Alabama where aggregate prices are higher. So key, uh, key items to keep in mind when it comes to inland protection, it's important to have the proper structural reinforcement, whether that's staking or bracing. You want to provide for overtopping. You know, our goal is to impound as much water as we can. So keep in mind that these practices will overtop at some point within the installation. So provide either a dedicated spillway, a weir, or uh, just have a low spot where you know water is gonna be directed. Prevent undercutting. We can do that by having a geotextile underlay, stapling material down so that it doesn't float, it doesn't become buoyant. Um, and then have a defi efficient dewatering mechanism so that you minimize water sitting in a channel or water sitting around the inlet for a significant extended period of time and also minimize your, your flood hazard. So, you know, be creative with inlet protection practices. Here's a, an installation that used three practices in series. You've got a dome on the inside, a manufactured device. You've got a wattle barrier uh, around it. And then you've got your uh, silt fence around the outside of the entire perimeter. And then on top of that, you've got vegetated buffers, right? So you, there's a treatment train uh, that's in place here for any runoff that's flowing into that uh, inlet structure. So I've seen many of you have already started answering our poll. Um, and this is a, a trick question here. So the question is properly installed inlet protection practices are effective at capturing fine sized soil particles and reducing turbidity. And the correct answer here is it's false. With inlet protection practices, you typically cannot treat the fine sized soil particles and you typically cannot reduce turbidity. What you are doing is you're slowing that water down enough to where you can capture your larger soil particles that are gonna settle out, you know, rapidly settable solids, uh, and you're, you're capturing that, keeping that from clogging up your storm drain infrastructure, um, and then providing an area for that deposited sediment to be cleaned out. Uh, but don't think of inlet protection practices as a way of reducing turbidity or reducing um, the, the fine soil particles that can still wash through. Barry, you don't have to click us out of this question. Yeah, yeah so real, yeah, go ahead, Barry. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so uh, a few things, or, or one big thing that I, I want to highlight that that Mike 
presented to you earlier was um, sediment control practices aren't, uh, they may be sold as filtering practices, but that's not really where the effectiveness comes in. It's, it's when you pond that water, you showed the, the aggregate inlet protection and where all the sediment was piled up. It wasn't against the rock being filtered as it goes through. It was, it was back where the fast water met slow water. And as that water slowed down, uh, it lost its sediment carrying uh, capacity. So, so that's, that's something that's often sold to us, uh, but it's just not what we ought to be looking for because you know, all, uh, even if it does filter to an extent, all sediment, uh, sediment management practices clog if they're doing their job. And so I think that's important to note. And also uh, the, the point about turbidity, uh, we're not gonna get turbidity um, management uh, or at least uh, to, a, to an extent that's, you can say it's good and polished, uh, you're probably gonna need a, a sediment basin or something else as a part of a, a fuller treatment train. Uh, I'll also apologize to Mike uh, while I'm here. I wanted to respond to the chat but every time I started typing, I started advancing his slides. So sorry about that, that Mike. Uh, and um, so uh, Comer Carter, uh, thank you for the, the comment about the Georgia DOT type C silt fence. If you guys are interested in looking more at Georgia practices, you can do a quick search for the Georgia Green Book uh, and you can get to their erosion and sediment control manual. And they've got a pretty good handbook also. And, and hopefully one day you'll be able to do a search for the Alabama Blue Book and it'll pull up our hand, handbook for, or our manual for erosion and sediment control. And, and Megan, uh, I've never seen a cow eat a, a, a waddle on a construction site, but I have seen turkeys eat, uh, eat, eat waddles on a construction site. So, so thank you guys for, for the input. Sorry, I, I wasn't able to respond as those were coming in. All right, so let's uh, quickly talk through maintenance and inspection and decommissioning or, or the removal of of these uh, sediment management practices as we're finished with them. And it's, it is super important to install sediment uh, management practices. And it's also super important to get them off the job when they're no longer functioning or, uh, or no longer necessary. They can, their presence can actually work against us. And we'll, we'll talk through that in a little bit. So uh, thinking about inspection and maintenance and, and decommissioning, there's there are check check box. Uh, I'm sorry, checklists. If you if you go digging in the the Georgia manual, there's checklists. You could go to the Alabama uh, handbook and you could create a checklist. And and it really checklists ought to be created for your project for your certain situations. And so what I want to do today is go through go through some uh, I guess bigger picture things. I, I'm no longer a a stormwater inspector. Um, the majority of the time that I'm hired or, or people ask me to look at their project, I'm not doing daily or weekly inspections and creating a report. I'm looking at those projects from a bigger picture. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm going in asking myself some questions. And so I, I wanna lead you through kind of what I do. And then you supplement that with the, the more detailed checklist about your specific project and your daily work. And, and so some of the questions that I ask myself as I'm, walking through doing some quality assurance type work as uh, I ask which of the five pillars are we addressing with this, this particular practice? What are our objectives related to those, those five pillars? Are we meeting those objectives? And then a biggie more recently, say over the last two years is what are the associated risks uh, related to this particular practice? And I, I've been doing, um, a lot of work with, with utility scale solar facilities and my clients are in several cases, the investment firms who, uh, who, who funded the project or plan to sell the project or otherwise have some financial stake in the, uh, in the construction and the production uh, associated with this project. And so as I've started doing my work for them, I've started reporting out based on the risk that I see to their investment. And so, uh, you know, a, a regulatory risk is an obvious one. A, a regulatory problem can shut the project down. It can delay the project. It can create fines. Uh, it can also be associated with community expectations. So if you've got a, a project that's continually 
spitting sediment into the, in, onto the neighbor's property or into a, a stream that people care about, then you know our neighbors expect us to behave in a certain way as we do our work, and that could create delays and uh, and financial problems for the the owner or the the, the investor that I might be working for. Uh, legal expectations. There are provisions in the Clean Water Act that that allow the us as individual citizens we can sue. Uh, the, the operator or the owner of, of a site that's causing damage, sediment related damage on our site. And so I report on that as, you know, we've got this situation here that, you know, if we're not careful, someone could actually sue us for that. Operations and maintenance, if we're creating gullies out there or allowing gullies to develop or we're allowing sediment to pile up, say uh, that, that uh, solar array where those guys are standing there, as those solar panels tilt, particularly to the east in this case, the bottom of that solar panel is actually touching the ground, touching the, the sediment that's built up underneath that panel. And that's not good for the operation of that panel and, and for maintenance uh, needs in the future. And then the, the last thing I have listed there is, say I'm working for the owner as their represent, uh, represent excuse me, representative, are there issues that are cr being created uh, on the site that could cause the contractor to file a claim later on. And, I, and so I let them know of those, those particular risks also. And so as we go through uh, inspecting our practices, and I'll, I'll walk through construction pads and uh, or exit pads, sediment barriers and inlet protection with this same kind of thinking. But, but you know, as we, we may not think about a construction exit pad actually having a communication element to it uh, where, you know, where those uh, trucks enter and leave a construction site. Uh, as Mike pointed out, if there's no designated location, where do you think they're, they're going to enter and leave? It's wherever they want to <laughs> most of the time. And how about managing work? Does the sequence and stage of construction play a part in where the, the pad goes and what that looks like? Yeah, it, it absolutely does. Managing water is not necessarily a, a primary objective of the, the construction exit pad. But if we don't uh, uh, allow for drainage, say we, we put this pad uh, right on top of a swale adjacent to a roadway and we, we forget to put the pipe in there, uh, we're going to have a water related issue. And so we walk ourselves through those five pillars and um, and, and so this, this construction exit pad right here was, uh, was a really good looking pad when it was first installed, but, but several months later, it, it started to look like this. And so it, it's not a, a matter of poor construction or, or a matter of the contractor did something wrong. It just simply needs maintenance. Remember, all these practices are temporary and therefore they're, they're not intended to last forever. And so as sediment built up in this ex exit pad, then it, it began to clog. I was actually uh, on this site this week and, and looked at this pad and it's, uh, we, we freshened this up a long time ago, added some new aggregate. Uh, Mike it mentioned earlier, uh, trying to slope our exit pads away from the roadway. I think as we're constructing those pads, that's absolutely good advice. And we have to uh, keep in mind that we might add, actually add aggregate to that, depending on how long it's going to be in service. This particular uh, exit pad here, um, it ultimately had to be torn out and reconstructed. Why do you think that is? It's uh, the dimensions are right, the aggregates right. It's got good drainage underneath. Uh, well, eventually we had to build the road. You know, we we put this exit pad here in a place where. Uh, there's going to be a, a, an intersection with the, the existing road and the new road that we're building. Uh, it was a good spot to put it, but, but again, those are temporary and, and they have to be pulled out uh, as, we, as we start to build the project. So thinking about that sequencing, thinking about staging, uh, we've got to get all that in place as we're, uh, and think about those things as we're, as we're doing our inspections. So the, 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 purpose of the, the construction exit pad to minimize the transport of sediment beyond the limits of the construction site. The concern is sediment uh, deposition on roadways. And then you can, you can imagine what the associated risks might be with regulatory uh, concerns. Your, your regulator does not have to be visiting your project 
to see that you've got a problem out there on the road that they're traveling. It may be their windshield that's getting cracked. And so it's a, it's a regulator magnet. Uh, if you've got sediment being tracked out onto a public roadway and then, you know, safety and, and, and damage to vehicles, those are legal, legal problems, uh, social issues. People don't like muddy, uh, muddy roadways. And then uh, we know that, that that mud, if it's tracked out onto a roadway, uh, it can eventually be washed into a waterway. So let's, uh, let's look at sediment barriers now. Does a, does a sediment barrier have a communication element to it? Well, uh, this photo was sent to me uh, last week. It's on one of the projects that I'm working on. It's a shot from a drone um, that was taken about a month ago. Uh, and the, the sender uh, questioned whether or not the material beyond the sediment barrier was offsite. Uh, and, and the truth is, I noticed this situation about a month ago, and I chose to, to not force the contractor to fix it that day or even that week. We, we had bigger things to worry about. I didn't want them to, to, to draw their attention away from this site or uh, away from what they were working on. And to the right of this photo, uphill, you've got about 200 feet to the, the property boundary. And downhill where this, this water wants to go, we've got about a hundred feet or a hundred yards of that thick vegetation between us and a, a stormwater conveyance, which is on down the way. And, and, then, and then several BMPs beyond that. So was I right to tell the contractor to keep working on what they were working on or should we go on and pick and fix this? Well, I'm gonna argue that I'm right. Uh, but I, I think the, the lesson here is um, this looks bad. I, I have to acknowledge that it looks bad and, and appearances matter in our work. And that's, that's the bottom line. So you've got you've to weigh that uh, also. So a, a, a lack of maintenance at this sedim sediment barrier did in fact become a communications issue. So what was my contractor communicating when he could have chosen any other place on the planet to uh, drop these materials, but chose to drop them right on the silt fence? You know, you just say, you know, come on guys. You know, we, we talked about this, uh, this photo uh, earlier and, and sometimes we, we do. Mike, Mike says that we, we discourage the use of silt fence for communication purposes and he's right. Uh, Sometimes we leave the silt fence up there for communication purposes. Uh, again, it's not a, a best practice, but um, like a, a, a friend uh, I knew, know used to say a long time ago, uh, if it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. So sometimes we, we do, uh, <laughs> we do uh, get ourselves into uh, situations where the, the benefits outweigh the, the, the risks. So on this, uh, this solar site here, the, the contractor walked me down to the bottom of the hill to show me exactly how hard he was having to work to, to prevent sediment from leaving the site at that discharge point. And so after we got down there, I walked him straight up to back up the hill to where I'm standing, taking this photo and, and explained to him that there is no reason that that gully exists along, along this access road. He needs to let this water go where it wants to go. You can see the, the really nice vegetated buffer between the silt fence and the, the boundary fence. Let's, let's use some J hooks. Let's let that water go. Like Mike was uh, explaining to us earlier, you know, with a J hook, the, the purpose isn't for that water to just keep on going down the hill inside the perimeter. It's to eventually let it go to give the silt fence some relief. And if you don't, you're going to end up with Maybe a, maybe a gully alongside the silt fence like we have here and certainly some issues trying to manage the water at the bottom of the hill. So this photo here looks a, a little bit odd. Uh, we've got vegetation over there that uh, looks like where our silt fence might be backward. But what's actually going on is uh, that, that vegetated area at the top uh, that was preserved. There's more work up, up, up gradient from here. And we were having turbidity issues uh, uh, with, with turbid water coming out of this vegetation and then going uh, on into the headwaters of, of Seabury Creek down there with you guys. And so we, what we did was we used this silt fence not only to, uh, to, to pond water and try to help manage some of that, some of the heavier sediment, uh, let it get caught in the vegetation, 
but also we, we cut some weirs to direct the flow as it comes over the silt fence. Let's tell it where to go. Water's dumb. We get to tell it where to go and how fast to get there. And so in this case, we told it, we wanted it to flow over our flocculent block. And you can see on the, the silt fence closest to us, the, the green there uh, between the riprap and the silt fence, that's a, a flocculent block. And so we wanted to introduce some mixing there. And so we used our sediment barrier for more than, more than just uh, holding back sediment. Now, oftentimes we, we leave it up to luck to, uh, to determine where water is going to run over or around our, our sediment barriers. Um, I thought this was a, a pretty ingenious solution that one of our inspectors, Eric Gotro, came up with. Uh, it's simply a pile of aggregate that, that lowers the top of the, the silt fence at a desired location and provides some scour protection on the backside. And Eric will tell you that it was, it was simply an accident that, that uh, this, this situation came to be, but I think it took some thinking on his part and some, some recognition of the importance of making accommodations uh, for when this sediment barrier reaches its capacity. We know that there will be a rain in your area, in the, the coastal area, there will be a rain that overwhelms your BMP. So where does that water go when, it, uh, when your practices reach their capacity? So with sediment barriers, the purpose of the sediment barrier is to, to minimize the transport of sediment beyond the limits of the construction site. Uh, our concern is sediment discharge and deposition. Um, it addresses transport by, by non-conveyance related flows. Uh, and, and we're talking about sediment barriers, not ditch checks in this, this particular place. And, uh, and the associated risks associated with sediment barriers are regulatory risks, legal risks, and of course, environmental risk. So let's walk through a, a couple of good, good photos here. You can see the uh, silt fence or a sediment barrier is being, being used to prevent um, sediment from leaving this waste pile and getting down toward the creek. You can see in the, uh, say the upper right and the upper left of the photo, you can see the, the uh, silt fence managing sediment at the perimeter of the site. And then you can also see toward the top there silt, a, a silt fence sediment barrier placed at the, uh, the toe or down gradient from that material stockpile. Here's some silt fence just, just run along the um, um, uh, a haul road through a wetland area. You know, those are, we're talking about inspection and maintenance here. We, we need to get out of the truck and, and look and see what's going on. Uh, this particular sediment retention barrier here, you can see the the line on the silt fence where turbid water got up to, and uh, it looks like everything's going great, but we actually had some turbid water go beyond this silt fence and, and ultimately make it to a, uh, a, a little beaver pond down, down gradient. And so we studied and studied and, and you know, we simply had turbid water going through both layers of filter um, of, of geotextile fabric and the, the hay bales. And so we added some flocculant and we put put some more barrier down, down on into the woods to, to try to manage that. Now this, the sediment retention barrier here, it, it saved us. You know, the, the first, you can see the, the first silt fence, that first line of defense was damaged during a storm event, but then we still had the hay bales and the, the silt fence behind to, to try to capture some of those, uh, some of those he heavier particles. Again, turbidity, it's, it's hard to control. And uh, we did have turbid, turbid water get beyond this, uh, this practice also. Um, so in, in this case, we're, we're getting ready to construct a, a bridge where the, the track is sitting. We were constructing the, the access road there. And uh, Seabury Creek is, is, I'm standing on one bank looking across the creek at, at this work area. And our, we have a line of piles, a, a bent, bridge bent, falls right, right where that silt fence is, right at the top of the bank. We wanted a more robust sediment control there, but, but we couldn't fit it in there and do our work. And so what we do, it did was we, we moved the compliance point back. We moved it uphill. We put a, a more robust uh, aggregate berm there. We eventually covered the face of that with, uh, with fabric. And so now the silt fence, it only has to handle the raindrops that fall in the location there between the, the riprap berm and the, and the silt fence. We had water bars on the access road to divert the water running down the road into uh, to behind the, 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 
the aggregate berm there. And then when we came in to drive pile, we pulled up a section of fence, we drove the pile and we put it right back and, and had a successful operation there. So um, keep in mind that sediment barrier does not have to be at the property line. Uh, preferably if we can get ourselves away from that, that boundary, we'll give ourselves some cushion. And if we can do that with vegetation, then, then all the better. So with inlet protection, um, does that have a communication element to it? Does this have a communication element to it? So I pointed out earlier in regulation that uh, that inlet protection is required uh, if you if for for when that inlet goes uh, discharges directly to receiving waters. In this case, there's a sediment basin downstream, but it or down gradient, it it still uh, is a communication problem in in my opinion. This isn't my job, but I do uh, visit this neighborhood from time to time. Uh, this is also not my job, but I run through it every morning or some mornings when I run. Um, you know, it's a communication issue. It's not a necessarily an inlet protection issue. It's a it's a communications issue. You know, how many bad things can you fit in one photo? There's a lot going on there. Um, one tricky thing about inlet protection is is we want to hang on to dirty water but we know that that dirty water or, or that water has to go into the inlet that it was designed to go into. And we talked about inlet bypass earlier and how that creates problems. It's, it's not good enough just to simply place a BMP or a, a practice. It needs to be functional. Um, are, we, are we being helpful with, uh, with placing this or allowing this practice to stay in place? Maybe it was necessary, but uh, now, we're actually being harmful with that uh, that BMP. This morning on the way in, I noticed a, uh, a, a similar inlet protection device in a median of a, a roadway I was driving on. And with the rain we've had, water was backed up almost onto the, uh, the edge of pavement. And there, there's no need right now for that inlet protection to be there. The, the, the work area is stabilized. It's, the work's been completed. So sometimes it can be harmful to, uh, to leave an inlet protection device in place. And, and rather re than resorting to this kind of silliness, uh, we just need to pull it up, uh, especially if we have a sediment basin between us and the, and the receiving water. So the purpose of the sediment or the, the inlet protection to minimize the sediment, uh, transport of sediment beyond the limits of the construction site. You see the concern, uh, this addresses enclosed conveyances and, and you see the associated risk there. Um, so is, is, this, is this inland protection functioning? It's a clean looking gutter, clean looking street. But again, the purpose is to keep sediment out of the drain. This isn't working for us. This is really ugly, but it's catching some sediment. I would say that the, the inlet protection hasn't failed here. Your, your, your sediment barrier, the whatever we were doing, to keep sediment from getting in that gutter in the first place. That's what's, what's failed. So Mike talked about the four stages of, of inlet protection uh, that, that we need to be looking at as we're doing our inspections. There's stage one on the left. The waddles aren't stage one. The sump around that inlet, that's what's catching the, the majority of the sediment. You know, the, the photo on the right, that piece of plywood, that is a best practice at this stage of construction. There's not much else you can do about it other than get past this stage of construction. And that's a managing work, managing erosion issue. Photo of uh, stage two installation. Uh, so this is kind of a transition. You can see the trenching there ready to, uh, uh, ready to install that, that uh, configuration. Mike, we, we had a, uh, a design example set up here and I, I think we're just simply out of time. I would rather spend the next four minutes answering questions and going through the, uh, the knowledge quiz if that's okay with you. Yeah, I agree. So we're gonna, good work on that, Mike. Oh, sorry, we're, <laughs> it would have been great, everyone. Uh, so Mike, uh, I guess, I guess we'll, let's back up. Uh, the, the learning objectives for this, uh, this, this part of the workshop series, we explain the function and role of sediment control practices within a comprehensive stormwater management plan. Remember, five pillars is a part of that, creating that comprehensive plan. 
Uh, we described the state of the practice for sediment control practices. Mike showed you literally national state of the art uh, sediment control that uh, he's been working on there at Auburn University. Uh, and then uh, we, we I've shown you how to apply those, those uh, principles and processes um, to your work as a stormwater professional for maximum, perfect, maximum effectiveness. So Mike, I'll let you work, walk us through the, the knowledge quiz and, and discussion. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. So uh, we had a couple of review questions that we set up here using Poll EV. So go ahead and, and jump back into Poll EV. And uh, the first question we have is which of the following practices should be installed prior to earth disturbing activities? And I'm saying that yes, all of the above is correct. You wanna make sure your construction exit pads, your storm drain inlet protection and your sediment barriers are installed uh, before major earth disturbing activities. Good job on that. Barry, you've got to click us through on the questions. Okay. So my right. uh, second question, I, uh, I quickly mentioned this as we were talking about inlet protection, but what is the maximum contributing area for a storm drain at inlet? 50-50 on that. So it's actually one acre and I'm not a fan of this rule or this guidance because it comes down to uh, the amount of rainfall you have and the local site condition. So this is really one of those rules of thumb that uh, I'm just not a big fan of. And then on top of that, you know, we don't really control the design area for a catch basin uh, inlet. That's up to the hydraulic engineer who designed where the, the placement of those inlets. So, but just EPA says we should limit it to one acre. So that's the correct response for this particular question. A sediment barrier consisting of two rows of jute netting or silt fence, straw and flocculent is known as, that's right, it's a sediment retention barrier or an SRB. The most effective approach to manage soil loss on a construction site is to install silt fence around the perimeter of the site. Yes, definitely false. We, you know, we've got a lot more uh, uh, work to do as far as you know, managing uh, communication, managing work, managing water, managing erosion, and then managing sediment would be uh, arguably the, the least effective thing we could do once we've accomplished all the other uh, pillars of uh, our managing construction stormwater pillars. All right, what size stone is appropriate for construction exit pads? Yes, number one stone is our target aggregate size for sure. Yeah, well, folks, thank you again. I, uh, I told you we had a lot of content to cover today and, and we're, we're kind of paying the price for all of that content right now. And, and so I'm sorry to squeeze us on the back end. Uh, are there, um, I guess uh, I'll, just throw out there, don't forget about our, our next um, our next workshop and, and we're gonna cover sediment basin. That'll be sediment basin design, sediment basin installation, construction and, and maintenance and uh, really dig into how we can polish off the turbidity from our, our construction site runoff. And so uh, Mike uh, Shelton, I, I haven't looked through the, the chat uh, in the last couple of minutes. So if there's anything remaining there or Anything we need to wrap up as far as uh, participant questions, let's do that now. No, I don't see any uh, any questions, but I do, I mean, I really appreciate uh, from the participant side, the uh, injecting things regarding like the the uh, other other resources that are out there and, uh, and um, you know, other, uh, other, the availability of the handbook and the like, uh, you know, those are, those are all real important to, to share this information, to learn, to to learn from each other, peer learning is a great way to uh, to really get this uh, uh, these these processes on the ground. And and you know, I, I know from from my point of view, there's always somebody out there smarter than me that I can learn from. And so uh, uh, I do appreciate uh, all the participants injecting uh, information into the chat and encourage that to continue on. Um, I. I do have a um, I do have uh, the evaluation link that I put in the uh, in the chat, and so if you could uh, if everybody could take advantage of that and, and help us out with uh, 
learning uh, learning more about how we do this, um, uh, how we do these workshops, and see. Uh, you know, it, it, th th these would be great workshops if we were also standing outside in the field surrounding these practices and, and talking about them. And uh, maybe not today because it might be raining, but um, I do appreciate everybody sticking with us. And thanks to uh, Mike and Barry, and also thanks to Laura for helping us put these on. And, and Barry already reminded you uh, about the next week's, uh, the final in the, uh, in the series of three. So if you, if you need registration information, let us know and I can always send that along or Barry or, or Laura can all, uh, or Mike can always send that along. So that being said, uh, we will see some of you next week and maybe all of you next week. Thanks everyone.